Well, welcome to the second session of week one, Revealing Jesus. Wasn't that an excellent start to the year? Some amazing pearls of wisdom of who Christ is to whet our appetites. And I'm just going to wrap it up with second session tonight. Who's hungry for more? Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let me pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you for the power of the revelation of Christ. I thank you for the deepness, the depths of the riches of the knowledge of you that seven weeks can't even begin to touch the surface of the unfathomable, unsearchable riches of Christ. But Lord, we want to still come. We want to still be hungry. We want to hear your voice. We want to be transformed. We don't want to be the same. So Holy Spirit, we ask that you would invade every heart within the sound of my voice tonight. That you would change us from the inside out. That you would reveal by the Spirit of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank you for the work that is eternal in this place and for the hunger of hearts. Intensify that, we pray, as we search deeper into your word tonight. And everybody said, Amen. 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 Well, last night, the Lord woke me up at 3 (laughs) a.m. and spoke. And it was a real sacrifice of praise because I love my sleep. (laughs) And here I'm quoting, Lord, you give your beloved sleep. (laughs) But he chose at 3 a.m. in the morning to awaken me. And he said to me, Hosea 6. So can we just turn there as we start with this second session? I'm going to go to it in the Amplified Classic Our friend John always kids around that I love the AMPC. That should be called the AMP Cheryl. (laughs) But since discovering this amazing new amplified version, I I love it. And uh, it brings out so much more. So let's go to Hosea 6. Starting at verse 1, this session is called the rock of offence. The rock of offence. But let's start here in Hosea 6 as God has directed us, reading in the Amplified Classic. Come and let us return to the Lord, for he has torn so that he may heal us. He has stricken so that he may bind us up. After two days, he will revive us, quicken us, give us life. On the third day, he will raise us up that we may live before him. Verse 3, here we come, revealing Jesus. Verse 3, yes, let us know, recognize, be acquainted with and understand him. Let us be zealous to know the Lord, to appreciate, give heed to and cherish him. His going forth is prepared and certain as the dawn. And he will come to us as the heavy rain, as the latter rain that waters the earth. When I woke up in the morning, there was torrential rain. Amen. (laughs) The first day that we are gathering again as a school of apostolic and prophetic, there was a sudden torrential fall of rain. I was watching the news uh, tonight and Usually the weather forecast is relegated to the end of the news forecast, the newscast, and they had to talk about the weather. It was so strange. It was so out of the ordinary. They had the weatherman on in the, in the main part of the news saying, this is why we've gotten this torrential rain. There's flash f- flooding. There were all sorts of things that happened. I tell you that God still speaks in signs. Amen. God is encouraging us that us gathering here to reveal who he is is not just by chance. God is in this. And he was encouraging me here in Hosea 6. He will come to us as the heavy rain. 
Who's looking forward to God coming to us in these next seven weeks? I'm so excited. As the latter rain that waters the earth, O Ephraim, what shall I do with you, says the Lord? O Judah, what shall I do with you? For your wavering love and kindness are like the night mist or like the dew that goes early away. Therefore have I hewn down and smitten them by means of the prophets. This is a school of the apostolic and prophetic. Amen. Here we come to the real prophetic. I have hewn down and smitten them by means of the prophets. I have slain them by the words of my mouth. My judgments pronounced upon them by you prophets are like the light that goes forth. Hallelujah. I want to tell you that the judgments of God have been released on the earth and are like the light that goes forth. Light is the revelation of Christ. I want to tell you that COVID-19 is the revelation of Christ. It is his judgment on the earth. Do you know what his judgments are? They are his voice. That is why we must love them. Even though they are hard on the flesh, even though they seem severe, At times, even though we may not even understand why, it is his voice. I mean, come on, COVID-19, ingenious. Not one soul on this planet has not been touched by COVID-19. Every single person on this planet has been exposed to the judgment of God has been exposed to the voice. How wise is our God? How powerful, how beyond fathomable wisdom has he that he has declared his voice, who he is. I am judge. I can give life and I can take it. I am the creator. You are the creation. His voice has resounded to every single soul on this planet. These are the judgments of God. This is what the true prophetic declares. And here is a litmus test. If you do not believe COVID-19 is from the Lord, you need to read your Bible. Old Testament and New speaks of the plagues sent by the Lord. Are we hearing his voice? He wants to come. But hey... He may not come in a way that you want him to. But he is the I am. I am that I am. Who are we to say how he should come or how he should voice himself? He is God. We must listen. Amen? Amen. Verse 6, For I desire and delight in dutiful, steadfast love and goodness, not sacrifice, and the knowledge of an acquaintance with God, the knowledge of an acquaintance of God, more than burnt offerings. Verse 7, but they, like less privileged men and like Adam, have transgressed the covenant. There have they dealt faithlessly and treacherously with me. Turn to 1 Peter 2, 7 to 9. With me. One Peter two, seven to nine. This message is called Christ the Rock of Offense. I pray that you would not take offense to the length of the notes tonight. (laughs) We won't be going through all of them. I do want to be able to wrap up uh, around 9.30 our time. We'll see what the Lord does, amen? (laughs) But you can take those notes as a resource. I encourage you to grab a folder for this year to begin to uh, compile a library, your own notes, your own revelations that the Lord's speaking to you, verses that the Lord is giving you during these sessions, during the week, to do with the revelation of Christ It will be an amazing resource for you in ministry and just in general life. Amen? 
So thank you, Lord. What was I going to? First Peter 2, 7 to 9. Can somebody read that out? Therefore, to you who believe, he is precious. But to those who are disobedient, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. And the stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble, being disobedient to the word, to which they also were appointed. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Awesome. He is a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. Or in the King James, I believe it's the rock of offense. The rock of offense. This unit is called Revealing Jesus, and one of his names is the rock of offense. See, when you preach Christ, it will offend. Amen? Amen. If you're not offending the flesh, you're not preaching Christ. See, when his sword comes, it will polarize. When the revelation of Christ comes, it will divide. What does Hebrews 4.12 say? His word is living and active, sharper than a two-edged sword, judging the thoughts and intents of the heart, dividing between soul and spirit. What does the Gospel of Matthew say? I've not come to bring peace, but a sword. And mother will be against daughter, father against son, mother-in-law against daughter-in-law, which isn't that hard to begin with at times. But the sword will come. The members of your own family will be against you, it says. This is the effect of the revelation of Christ, the word, the sword. So preacher, don't be surprised when you preach Christ unadulterated that people (coughs) will leave. And they have left. (laughs) I call it the revolving door of the spirit of truth. I've had people say to me to my face, I didn't sign up for this. You didn't sign up for Christ? Because that's all I preach. Where in the word can you show me is something that I have preached that's, that's not Christ? Where, show me in the word what I'm preaching is not Christ. Not one <laughs> has returned who has left to take me to scripture. Oh, but I don't like the feel of it. I didn't sign up for this. Friend, the truth is that you have bought into a false gospel. And when presented with the sword, presented with Christ the person, you have rejected him. You have discovered the rock of offense. (laughs) This must happen, friends. If you're preaching Christ, people will be offended. Expect it. Even embrace it. That's what happened to Christ. You are in good company. See, the revelation of Christ will polarize the church. You will either grab a hold of him, no matter what the cost, that pearl of great price that that Chris was talking about, sell everything to have him. Or you will reject the person Embrace something that is another Jesus, a false gospel that allows you to still live your own life the way you want to live it. And there are 50,000 churches out there who will affirm that to you. But here's the thing. My call is to reveal Christ. Your call is to reveal Christ. And with that will come a responsibility 
To him who has been given much, much is required. I want to tell you that God is requiring something of you tonight. Is that okay? When the revelation of Christ, when the preaching of Christ and him crucified comes forth, there is a requiring. You will either run from him or run to him. I would advise you to run to him. (laughs) Know that he is the rock of offense. This is the true gospel. He is a stone the builders rejected. And then it comes to you, but then you are a chosen people. If you choose a rock of offense, then you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. Has he possessed you? Really? Are you completely his? That you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Isn't that awesome? I want to set the scene tonight. Why are we doing, devoting a whole unit on revealing Jesus? Why? Because revealing Jesus is the one thing. (laughs) Amen? We're going to start right at the main thing, the one thing. (laughs) Because... The role and call of the church is not evangelism. It's not care groups. It's not programs. It's not youth and children's ministry. It's not fellowship. Those things are just byproducts. The role of the church, the job of the church is to reveal Jesus. Let's turn to Ephesians 3.10. I want you to be prepared, this unit, for God to debunk (coughs) some things that have taken root in our hearts as a church that are not him. Because as we see Christ revealed, you will also see what is not Christ. It will become obvious. And I praise God for his mercy that he begins to shine his light of the revelation of Christ and it begins to show what is not his light. It begins to show up what in secret is really not him that we don't need. But here is his primary purpose and his role, the definition of the church. Verse 10, his intent was that now through the church, who's the church? Us, the manifold wisdom of God, that's the knowledge of God, should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms according to his eternal purpose that he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. The job of the church is to reveal Jesus. If you're not revealing Jesus as he is in fullness, you are not the church. Come on. Anyone say an amen? Amen. If you are choosing to reveal only parts of scripture that you like, that appeal to man, that draw a crowd, that is forming another Jesus, 2 Corinthians 11, 4. A more palatable gospel. You have now deviated from Christ as he is. You are no longer the true church. (coughs) Did he not say in Revelation, rebuke the church, I'm about to take your lampstand from you. What is a lampstand? It shines the light of the revelation of Jesus. Psalm 119 says, Your word is a light unto my path, a lamp unto my path, a light unto my path, a lamp unto my feet. One of those. (laughs) You know what I mean. (laughs) What is it? Lamp Lamp unto my feet and light unto my path. You get a gold star. (laughs) 
The word is a light. Yes. Amen? Amen. Mm-hmm. When what calls itself the church stops revealing Christ unadulterated as he is, without excuse, without any watering down, the word of God as it is, it no longer becomes the church. It becomes something else. Mm-hmm. In fact... It becomes a stumbling block. Amen? Amen. This is why if you are called to ministry, preacher, teacher, be careful. Your job is to reveal Christ. Nothing else. A pastor's job is to reveal Christ. The shepherd. The one who comes alongside. The evangelist's job is to reveal Christ, the Savior. Now, here's the thing. If you're an evangelist, you feel that you're called to evangelism. And you're not preaching the gospel that says you are a sinner in desperate need of God, the Savior. You're not revealing Christ in that way. You are not preaching the gospel. I want to show you something. This is the verse that evangelists quote all the time. Make you, can you fill out the rest? Fishes of men. Amen. That's found in, who knows where that's found in? Matthew 4.19. Now we see ministries, churches called fishers of men. It's biblical, amen. But see, there is order in Christ. What comes first? Come follow me. That's what Jesus said, amen? Now, if you begin this walk with the Lord, (laughs) I've been walking with the Lord now about 20 years, you come to realize that this takes a lifetime. You need to come to him constantly and follow me. What does it mean to follow? To spend time with, to be with, to preach what they preach, to do what they do, to know them. Come follow me. Start with that evangelist. Start with that church of God. And then, who will make? I will make? Jesus said, he will make you into fishers of men. See the power of meditating on scripture. See, we're not called to witness. We are a witness. But here's the thing that has happened with man-made ministry. You get saved, go out and evangelize. What are you bringing them into, though? If you don't get this first and foremost, if you don't know Christ, if you don't let him reveal himself to you, if you don't stay with him, keep coming to him, follow him, what are you bringing them into? Come on. See, the church is called first and foremost to reveal Christ. Without that, the lampstand is removed. You're just a nice organization. Friend, I want to tell you that your ability gets in the way of God. Your people skills gets in the way of God. If you're growing a church because you're great with people, you love people, 
That's good. There's biblical concepts there. Yes. But if you lean on your people skills and your ability to mentor people and be great to people and understand what they need to hear, when they need to hear it, and with charisma, and if you lean on that, you're getting in the way of Christ. See, this is revealing Jesus' unit, school of apostolic and prophetic. We could have called this unit school of prophetic, school of apostolic. We would have gotten new people in who love the prophetic, who love the apostolic. We could have called it the school of real worship. It's all Jesus, isn't it? It's all revealing Jesus. We would have gotten people who have a love for that flavor. But I want to tell you, the true prophet... The true apostle reveals Jesus. In fact, anything other than that, anything that points to themselves, to the strength, to their ability, to programs, to things of God, they are absolutely mortified. This is the true prophet, the true apostle, the true prophetic and apostolic people. <coughs> They would be mortified that instead of what John the Baptist did, behold the Lamb of God. Just stay there. Who takes away the sin of the world. This Friday night at House of Prayer, I I just sense the burden of the Lord to pray, behold the Lamb. (laughs) Brian Houston of Hillsong, behold the Lamb. Preach Christ. You do that, the prophetic and apostolic will come. But our first and foremost role is to reveal Jesus. Not evangelism, not doing things for God. You know, as we were Going through the word and first session, I felt the burden of the Lord on that Matthew 7 passage. You know, we know it well. You know, did I not prophesy in your name? Did I not cast out devils? Did I not work miracles? And Jesus will say to them, get away from me, you evildoer. And as I was thinking on the next part of that scripture, I felt the weeping of the Lord. I never knew you. This is the burden of the Lord. I I could feel as he was saying that, weeping, I never knew you. You completely missed it. Intimacy with him is paramount. Everything else is on the altar. Everything else must come secondary. I could feel the burden you know, one of the encounters, most powerful encounters of the Lord I, I had in prayer was this bright, unapproachable light. It says, it talks about in Timothy, but I saw these arms coming out, reaching out in desperation, and it was the Lord saying, I am desperate that you would know me. I am desperate that you would come to me that I would show myself to you. That is what I created you for and not to be distracted with the stuff. Not to make fishes of men. Let me make you. Just stay there and the rest is just a byproduct. Be a witness. Now to be a witness, you need to see properly, don't you? You need to see him as he is. Or else, what are you witnessing about? You are giving false witness. If you are called to be a seer, this is the school of apostolic prophetic, great. Do you know what the primary role of a seer is? It's not to see in the spirit. It's to see Christ. That's the true prophetic. The spirit of wisdom and revelation that we may know him better. Ephesians. 
Have I given you an inkling of why this unit is so important? <laughs> why we start at the very start revealing Jesus? I love this unit because we're bringing focus back to where it must be. Come follow me. The primary role of the church is to reveal Jesus. Secondly, why are we doing this? Revealing Jesus unit. Because the preaching and knowing of Christ as he is, is the secret to victory. And we're going to go through the fullness of that in time. But remember how David slew Goliath in the name. It says in 1 Samuel 17, 45, declaring who Christ is fully, which is his name, revealing Jesus is the key to defeating the enemy. And I'm going to talk more about that. As soon as the church deviates from revealing Christ, preaching Christ as he is, it is already defeated. <clears throat> the enemy is having a field day. You are playing to his tune, you are in the palm of his hand. Mm -hmm. You are now delivering what is called dead religion. Mm -hmm. An alternative, you are in the way of Christ. Number three, to, sorry, to misrepresent who Christ is, is to preach another Jesus. Mm -hmm. This is a warning from the Lord. 2 Corinthians 11.4. The seriousness of this is that we now have become a deterrent, a man-made alternative to Christ and the true gospel. It is idolatry. It is the foundation of dead religion which keeps us from the true knowledge of Christ. The ministry you bring is now in the way of Christ himself. Friends, I preach this to you not just to hurt you. You know, the warnings and even the rebukes of the true prophetic and apostolic are to bring you to Christ. Amen? Amen? I was there. I was on the stage leading worship, leading youth ministry, and I didn't know him. I was in the way of people knowing Christ. I had to repent. I, was, I would weep uncontrollably in repentance over that. Lord, for so long, I stood in the way of you. But you know what? That's where freedom came. The mercy of God flooded into my heart. It is bringing us to Christ. Peter's error through humanistic thinking and soulish false compassion made him an obstacle to people knowing Christ. Matthew 16, 23, remember? Mm. No, not for you. You won't die on the cross, Jesus. Mm. His fleshly stinking thinking, I call it, mm -hmm. stood in the way of the ultimate revelation of God. You know, Christ on the cross was the ultimate revelation of God's heart, both his love and his wrath. wrath. I deserve to be on that cross. That's what the wrath of God looks like. And Christ took it for me. A revelation of that is a revelation of the heart of God himself, both his love and his wrath. Now here's a burning heart concept, the problem with the false prosperity gospel. We don't all know what that is, don't we? The problem with the false prosperity gospel which presents Jesus as a means to getting the prosperous life you want in this life is that it grossly misrepresents Christ. It is a false Jesus and a last day's mass deception. It is a teaching sent from the evil one. Can I make that clear? Don't go near it. Beware of preachers who promise you everything you ever wanted. Prosperity, ministry opportunities, a wife, husband, wealth, relationships, favor, even by so-called means of Christianity, they are not God's true servants. They are salesmen at heart with an agenda and bring a ministry rooted in self. If Christ and him crucified and the true gospel is not preached, run the other way. 1 Corinthians 2.2, I resolve to know nothing except... Christ and him 
crucified. I want to tell you, the Lord Jesus does not need a PR manager. <laughs> Amen. I know what a PR manager looks like. I was one. That was my industry. That's what I studied at uni. That was what I worked in for 20 years. I know what PR and marketing looks like. I know what sales is about. Mm -hmm. It's presenting the positive aspects of a product to lure people in for your own self-benefit. Christ does not need a PR manager. We must preach him as he is. Savory and unsavory parts, the things that grate on the flesh, I want it all. Amen? Because that is Christ the person. Now here's the thing. As I was seeking the Lord in these last five minutes, I have five minutes to cover this. It's going to be five minutes of power. <laughs> Miracles do happen. <laughs> As I was seeking the Lord for this session, this whole unit, he gave me an open vision of the crown of thorns. And he began to speak to me about the kingship. Christ is the King of kings, the Lord of lords. Amen. Amen. Revelation 19, he will be fully revealed as that. It was written on his thigh. He comes on the white horse in victory, revealing Christ as the king of kings. But see, the only crown that he wore while he was on the earth was a crown of thorns. And that crown of thorns, you'll read in the book of John. I love how John brings out a whole bunch of stuff. By the way, your recommended reading, sometimes I give recommended reading, your recommended reading this year is the Bible. <laughs> is that okay? <laughs> now, there is a library here that is available to you, and during the unit you can, um, it's an honor system, you can borrow books and bring them back by the end of the unit. That's all that we ask. But your recommended reading from here, from, from the unit, is the Word. Okay? <laughs> So what we're going to do, I put it in your notes, we're going to read Old Testament Job, the whole book of Job, and New Testament John, the whole book of John. Now, you might have read them already, but read them again. <laughs> we're going to read nine chapters a week. It's really easy. You can read two chapters for the first two days and then just one chapter for the rest of the week, a day, and you'll get nine chapters a week and you'll get through Job and John, both Job and John. The books that they wrote by the Holy Spirit bring such an intense revelation of God. I mean, Job himself, he had to go through stuff, amen, in order to bring this deep revelation that could not come any other way. So I encourage you, read the whole 42 books of Job. You can read ahead if you like. If you're hungry, just do it. <laughs> But we're going to look at Old Testament, New Testament, Revelation of Christ, Job and John. But John talked about the twisting of the thorns in the crown of thorns. You know, that crown of thorns was made up of inch or longer thorns that pierced into the temples, the head of the Lord Jesus speaks of the mind, speaks of the warfare that happens in the thought life. It speaks of persecution, opposition. See, when Christ is preached as king, there will be persecution. And it will be in the area of the thought life. And his challenge to you tonight, I believe, is who will wear my crown of thorns? Because in that is true authority. He doesn't give all authority willy-nilly. He entrusts it to ones who are willing to pay a price. Willing to suffer for his namesake. Margaret Court wears the crown of thorns. 
She's on the front line in the media, standing for who Christ is. He is holy. Homosexuality is a sin. And I will speak that from this pulpit till the cows come home. Old Testament, New Testament, if you are in homosexuality, you need to repent and turn to Jesus. And the blood flowed down his eyes, the eyes speak of the true prophetic. The warfare will be here. Will you have that perseverance, the word that was brought forth on Sunday, that resolve to set your face like flint? I will not move from who Christ is and I will face the persecution, the opposition, the intensity of hatred that will come my way because of it. There is true authority. Do you know, if you choose the narrow road, that is the narrow road. That is the gospel, the only gospel. That is the only way to follow Jesus. That kingship will come upon you. He has made us in revelation ultimately to be kings and priests. He will entrust you with real authority. Amen. Now, here's the thing. Turn to Matthew 2 real quick. And I want to show you something in Scripture of what happens when the revelation of Jesus comes. Talking of the kingship of Christ. See, there are other kingships at play. There is the kingdom of God versus the kingdom of man. That's why he said to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. He wasn't talking just about signs, wonders and miracles, by the way. That's just an outworking. He said the kingdom of God is within you. He was talking about his kingship in your heart. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Now in Matthew 2, we see the story of a bunch of kings. We see the story of a king named King Herod. Did you know that Herod means song of a hero? He fancies himself somebody. Song of a hero. King Herod represents false ministry. And then we also see, we've just been through Christmas. This is the Christmas story. We also see wise men who traditionally and culturally were called kings as well. Some believe they were the king of Sheba, the king of other different realms. But they were men of authority. They were wise men. They were magi. Now Christ came to earth. He was born of a virgin. I want to tell you when Christ comes, when the revelation of Christ comes, you will go one of two ways. You will go the way of King Herod or you will go the way of the Magi. I want to show you this in Scripture, Matthew 2 verse 1. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east, I'm just going to turn to AMPC, my favourite, Wise men, astrologers from the east, interesting east, that's representative of Revelation, came to Jerusalem asking, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen a star in the east at its rising and have come to worship him. How prophetic is that? They were prophetic. They were watching, searching out for the signs, the star of it rising in the east. It was symbolic of the revelation of Christ, the morning star. Verse 3, when Herod the king heard this, he was disturbed and troubled and the whole of Jerusalem with him. So he called together all the chief priests and learned men, scribes of the people, and anxiously asked them where the Christ was to be born. They replied to him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, you are not in any way least or insignificant among you, the chief cities of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler or leader who will govern and shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod sent for the wise men, astrologers, secretly and accurately to the last point, ascertained from them the time 
of the appearing of the star, that is how long the star had made itself visible since rising in the east. Then he sent them to Bethlehem saying, go and search for the child carefully and diligently. And when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. That was a bit of a facade, wasn't it? He really wasn't interested in worshipping Jesus. He wanted to kill Jesus. When they had listened to the king, they went their way, and behold, the star which had been seen in the east and its rising went before them until it came and stood over the place where the young child was. When they saw the star, they were thrilled with ecstatic joy. And on going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. No other response. Worshipped him. Then opening their treasure bags, they presented to him gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. And receiving an answer to their asking, they were divinely instructed and warned in a dream not to go back to Herod. So they departed to their own country by a different way. So here we see two kings, two types of king. The wise men, true worshippers, They had left everything to search out Christ. Can you imagine the amount of research and looking into the signs and the wonders that would lead to this king of kings? They were true worshippers, true seekers of God. And when they saw him, they fell down and worshipped and gave their lives. They gave these gifts that were so prophetic, the gold that speaks of the glory of God, the frankincense which speaks of prayer. This is a sign of what is true ministry. They will always say, seek God. Establish the house of prayer. And myrrh, which speaks of suffering, given to Christ on the cross. They will speak of what it is to suffer for Christ. This is how to know him, truly, to be willing to, if need be. These were the true worshippers. And once they worshipped Jesus, they were given divine discernment from God. Don't go back to Herod. He's false. What he said to you was a lie. And they didn't go back to him. That's a true worshipper. But now we see King Herod. He's his picture of false ministry. He gave the guise of wanting to worship Jesus. But in his heart, it is to kill Jesus. Now, here's the thing. When Jesus comes, just like we saw him come here, born of a virgin, when the revelation of Christ comes, you will do one of two things. You will fall down and worship him. Give your life. Seek him out. Or you will do what Herod did. Do everything you can to maintain your kingdom. And I'm talking about your own kingdom here. Oh, just reject the revelation of Christ. Oh, I don't, I don't read that part of the word. Why? Because it allows you to remain king of your own life. His kingship has not come to you. There is also the kingdom of man, of ministry. (laughs) See, Herod's heart was to kill the revelation of Jesus so that he could maintain his power, his status quo, his kingdom. I want to tell you that there are churches and ministries that are not willing to bring the full revelation of Christ as he is, love and judge the severity and the kindness of God. Why? Because it will mean losing their power, losing their kingdom, losing ministry opportunities, losing tithes, losing people in their congregation. They have become like King Herod. They have formed a kingship of their own making And they seek to kill Jesus. Now, what happened? The evilness of Herod, he killed the babies. 
the outworking of that was murder. I want to tell you that the outworking of not receiving the revelation of Jesus Christ, continuing in ministry in your own way, is spiritual murder. You are now accountable for those that are under you. You know what else? Herod was an adulterer, other lover. He took his brother's wife and he was a hater of the true prophet John the Baptist, took off his head. Why? Because he preached what he was doing was not Christ. (laughs) This is the insidiousness of what is false of allowing your own kingship of your ministry, your life, to remain. I want to tell you, when the revelation of Christ comes, it will be a rock of offense. People will leave. Let them leave. I'm going to stay with Christ. Amen? Let's just quickly stand to our feet. We'll pray quickly and wrap up. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. We bless you, Lord. Just go ahead and bless his holy name. We bless you, Lord Jesus. We honor you. We exalt you, Lord. We give you all our lives, all of our heart tonight. I thank you to whom has been given much, much is required. I thank you for the requiring of the Lord tonight on each heart. Lord, I want to respond tonight, even in these last few moments. Lord, we want the King of Kings. Lord, I pray that on this first night, Lord, by your Holy Spirit, that you would search hearts tonight. David said, search me and know me. Search out the motives of my heart. Search out if there's any area of which you are not supreme and king, where I'm still living my own life, my own kingdom, my own way. Lord, I pray by your Holy Spirit, by your mercy, by your love, you will begin to reveal Christ as King, that the kingship of Christ would come tonight to every heart, that we would be like the elders who are willing to throw down their crowns, throw down their ministries, I don't have to have that. I cast it down. It was an act of passion (laughs) that I may worship him truly, that I may be a worshiper. Lord, let that be the heart of everyone within the sound of my voice. Let the revelation of Jesus come to every heart tonight. Change us forever, we pray. I pray for fresh encounter, fresh, Lord, insight as we read your word this week. Speak to hearts. Change our lives. We want to meet with Jesus, we pray. I bless each one to know Jesus. We thank you. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Amen.